Like many people could say on Father's Day, my dad taught me a lot growing up. Now whether I learned them well, that's another thing. One thing in particular is the value of hard work to earn what you need and to get what you want. My dad worked hard all throughout his life, and now that he's older and doesn't have the health or strength he used to have, it's difficult for him to take it easy and to let others take care of some of the things that used to be his responsibility. He worked hard at a job that was more often than not longer than 40 hours each week, many times scheduled to be six or seven days. Every day my dad came home from work and he got to work on things around the house. Uh, this time of year it was putting in and tr uh, tending uh, one or more vegetable gardens in our yard around or around town. As it is in our homes today, there is always something that needed to be done. Things to move, clean, paint, repair, or replace. And I watched and helped my dad do a lot of that work. Now I'm pretty sure that my dad taught me these things hoping that I would be able to do them sometime in the future. He was anticipating that someday I would have my own family and home to take care of. So he taught me different things so that I would be ready when the need arises. Obviously it's not just dads who do this. Certainly we've all learned different things from different people in our lives. Moms and dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, neighbors so that we might be able to take care of ourselves, our families and friends, our homes and possessions someday in the future when the circumstances might call for that kind of knowledge, skill and experience that's passed from one person to another, from one generation to another. And that's what Paul did with Timothy. We can see a similar relationship between Paul and Timothy. As Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, he's writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul thought of Timothy as a son. So throughout their ministry together, Paul trained Timothy so that he would be able to do the same work sometime in the future. Now as we read along with Tim Timothy, we find that the future is here. Last week, when we began this study of 1 Timothy, we found that Paul had left him in Ephesus with the purpose of straightening out the problem of false teaching within the church. At that time, there were people who didn't know or understand God's word, but were causing uh, division and leading people astray because they thought they knew God's word. And so Paul wrote to Timothy to encourage him to be faithful to God's word, both in his ministry and in his everyday life, telling him in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Paul told Timothy this because there's a connection between our everyday life and our spiritual life. And when what we believe is disconnected from the way we live, we find division and conflict both in our personal lives and within the church. That's not what Paul wanted for Timothy or the church. In the opening words of the letter, chapter 1, verse 2, Paul hopes for God's grace, mercy, and peace. However, we can't have peace with God or with other people if we struggle with false doctrine that leads us away from God's grace and mercy. Last week we focused on how following God's word helps us to focus on God's work through our faith, to live godly lives, and to hold on to God's salvation. And Paul continues into the next chapter telling us how to grow in our relationship with God, first of all, through prayer. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. 
because false doctrine separates us from God, we must avoid it and remove it from our own lives and from the church. And here, Paul tells Timothy that the first step is to pray. Certainly, we need to confront false doctrine with true doctrine, that is, the truth of God's Word. But Paul is telling Timothy that if we're going to confront false doctrine with God's Word, if we're going to keep ourselves and bring others into peace with God through the preaching and teaching of the Gospel, we need to start by praying for peace. Paul tells Timothy to pray for peace so that we might be able to share God's Word, the Gospel, with everyone. Now, as a preacher of the Gospel, as a Bible teacher in general, I know the primary value of reading, studying, memorizing, knowing, internalizing, and living out God's Word. But we can't miss Paul's point here. Look at it again in verse 1. He writes, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Prayer is Paul's priority. We know it because Paul basically repeats himself. He doesn't just say, you guys better pray. He tells Timothy and the church to make requests of God, to, to pray to God, to intercede with God, to give thanks to God. In order for Timothy and the church to confront false doctrine and promote the true doctrine of God's Word, Paul tells them to pray, 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 pray for everyone. Pay attention to the importance Paul gives this instruction. He writes, I urge you. Paul's call to prayer is urgent. How urgent? Well, it's top priority. He says prayer needs to be the focus, first of all. Of all the instruction Paul is giving to Timothy uh, throughout this letter so that they might watch closely over their life and doctrine, prayer is first of all. And their prayer isn't just for their own sake, but, Paul says, for everyone, including, in verse 2, kings and all those in authority. Now, why does Paul give prayer such priority and importance? Because the problem of false teaching is so destructive, and the solution, the gospel, is so transformative. False doctrine is messing up their lives, it's messing up the church, and it's making it difficult to preach and teach the gospel so that others might be saved. And so Paul tells Timothy and the church, and us, to pray for peace so that God's work can continue, God's word can continue his work through the gospel. Paul tells Timothy and the church to pray so that, like he says in verse 2, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We need to pray in every way, every day, for everyone, so that we might live in peace. And not just so that our lives are without conflict with others, but so that there's a peaceful, orderly world in which we can preach and teach sound doctrine, the truth of God's word, the gospel of peace. First, we pray for peace in order to live right. That's the foundation Paul wants us to establish through our prayers. He writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness the peaceful, quiet lives Paul expects us to establish through prayer are godly, holy lives that follow God's Word. Now, earlier in the letter, Paul showed that misusing God's Word, false doctrine, leads people to live ungodly lives. He tells us back in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Now certainly we depend upon God's word to confront false doctrine, but we also depend upon prayer, asking God to help us stay focused on his word and his will. And so Paul writes in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. God's Word gives us everything we need to live godly lives, but prayer keeps us focused on those things so that God will help us to do those things. As we depend upon God to live godly lives, we find peace that not only transforms our hearts, minds, and souls, but enables us and encourages us to continue living godly lives and helping others to do the same through the Gospel and faith in Jesus. We also pray for peace in order to please God. As we pray for others so that we might live in peace, Paul tells us that this pleases God. He writes in verse 3, This is good and pleases God our Savior. There's a strong connection between pleasing God with godly living and living in peace. We can go to the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. So praying for peace in order to live godly lives pleases God. Now honestly, I don't know where we ever got the idea that God wants His people, the church, to pick a fight with the world around us. Yes, I know that Jesus said in John 15 verse 18 that if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. But just because the world will hate us doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray for peace for the world and in the world. In fact, Paul told Timothy very clearly, very simply, we need to stop fighting and start praying. He he wrote in 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. Now this growing trend among Christians that somehow we need to start fighting back like the world, it's simply unbiblical and unchristian because God clearly wants us to live in peace in the world. Paul wrote in Romans 12, verse 18, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy, because without holiness no one will see the Lord. Praying for everyone even kings, leaders, authorities who may oppose and persecute us, is the first step of working toward peace. And Paul says, this pleases God. Now, why would it please God? Well, first, it's simple obedience, evidence that we're actually pursuing God himself. But in this moment, here in Paul's letter, it's because God has a purpose to save others. Paul continues, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Praying for peace so that we can live godly, holy lives pleases God because it furthers His desire and plan to save the world. Because ultimately, we pray for peace in order to save others. God wants to save the world because he loves the world. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the gospel, the good news, the message God sent with Paul, the message Paul left with Timothy. That message was being corrupted by false teachers in the church. And as false doctrine corrupts the message of the church, the world can't be saved. And so Paul wrote this letter telling Timothy and the church, telling us to watch closely our life and doctrine, to pray for peace for everyone, so that sound doctrine, God's word, the gospel would be lived and taught in and through the church so that others might be saved. This is why Paul urged, first of all, that requests, prayers, 
intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone so that we might live in peace with everyone with a specific purpose of saving others. Yes, we pray for peace so that we might live godly lives, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of others. First uh, Peter 2 verse 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We need to pray for peace in, in this world so that we can have the opportunity to tell the world what God has done to give us peace with Him. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 through 7, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed, appointed a herald and, a, and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. This was Paul's purpose in the church. He was called, set apart by God, to preach and teach the gospel to the Gentiles so that they would know the truth of God's word, that they would put their faith in Jesus, that they would find peace and new life salvation through him. God sent Paul into the world to save the world. We have to remember that Paul's letter to Timothy isn't just a, a friendly reminder for Timothy and the church to, to be good for the sake of being good or even obedient, but also for the sake of those who would hear the gospel because of their prayers for peace. Again, towards the end of the letter, Paul writes, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. As we watch closely, paying attention to sound doctrine and praying for peace, we do it so that others can be saved. And so, church, we need to keep praying. As Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we need to pray continually. We need to pray in all circumstances for all people, making requests, interceding on behalf of others, always giving thanks to God. This is why I'm glad that each of our Bible studies, worship services, meals, even meetings begin and end with prayer. It's not how we start and stop our gatherings, it's how we stay on track, keeping ourselves focused on God's work, on God's will and on God's work in each of us, among all of us, and through us as the church. If we're going to be the people God is making us to be, if we're going to do the things that God has set apart for us to do, we need to pray. Pray continually. We need to pray for peace. And as we keep praying, God will keep saving both us and our hearers. So church, I, I encourage you to keep on praying for your own faith and knowledge, that you would keep on growing, for your brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would all remain faithful to God, to God's Word, and to the work He's given us to do, and for this world around us, for people in positions of power and authority, that they would work to bring us all peace. Keep praying for each other and for the world. Keep praying for peace so that God will continue to work in us and through us to save others. Now, for those of you who have not yet put your faith in Jesus, please know that, that I and other Christians, we're praying for you. We're praying that, that we can all live together in peace. And we're praying that God will continue to reveal himself to you through his word, through his people, the church, so that you might put your faith in Jesus and receive new life through him. Now, you can do that if you believe that Jesus is who the Bible tells us he is, the Christ, the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life. If you'll repent, turning away from your old sinful life and turning back to God. If you will confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life. And if you'll join with Jesus by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you do this, putting your faith in Jesus, God will save you. He'll forgive you and he'll come to live within you, helping you to live this new life in godliness, working with his, new, his family, the church,
as we continue working together to tell others the good news of God's love and forgiveness through Jesus. Now, if you're ready to make that decision, or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ. But until then, please let me pray for you. Thank you, Father, for the peace that we can have with you by your grace and mercy through faith in Jesus. And I pray right now for this world, uh, for the people who live here with me, my brothers and sisters in Christ uh, and everyone else. God, help us to live in peace. And Father, help us, the church, as we pray and work for that peace. Help us to make the most of our opportunities to share the good news of love and forgiveness and peace that you give us through Jesus so that others might be saved. Lord, open the hearts of the world that they might be saved. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.